for this morning. And Lord, as we come to the conclusion of this book, Lord, I, I pray you would keep, help us to keep our eyes open, Lord, and our hearts soft for your word, for your instruction. And Lord, that we might be amazed, Lord, of your sovereign hand in the lives of your people. Lord, your providence, I think too often we miss. And Lord, I pray this story as it closes would bear witness, Lord, to the fact that you're in every moment, every step. You're with every breath, every decision of the people that love you. And so, Lord, help us to recognize your guidance. Help us to appreciate, come to love it, come to seek it, Lord. And even thank you when we miss it. And so, Lord, help us now, Lord, as we, we close this book and hear from you. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's my hope that we're going to close today. It's been only four chapters, but it's, it's been a lot. It's amazing how much can get packed into such a small area of God's word. And as we come to this fourth chapter, obviously way too much to review in detail, but just the flow of the surface story, this woman Naomi and her husband and two sons who went off to a foreign land, which they shouldn't have, during a drought that they should have stayed with the rest of their people and faced. And yet even in that mistake, if you want to call it that, God was already at work. God was already at work in in what they were doing as an act of disobedience or maybe just a lack of faith. God already had a plan. Now they had to be obedient to that plan and we see that in at least the way the story unfolds, Naomi was obedient to that plan. And When the time came and she heard that back in Bethlehem the crops had come in, the famine was over, she returned, now minus a husband and two sons, and she comes back with one of her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth, the name of this book, and they come into the town celebrated, but the focus, as much as it is on Naomi coming home, it was really on Ruth that comes into a relationship with a people she didn't know, except for one family, and to a God she didn't know, except for the worship that one God, or that one family had for that God. And all these things unfold, and we come to understand part of their culture, that there was something that God had set forth for that culture, and that was that there would be a family member that could redeem the one who lost a husband and give name to that family, carrying on that name through a son, and also redeem the land that was sold. And so Ruth makes that decision with some instruction from Naomi, her mother-in-law, because Naomi really had the right to that relationship with that redeemer. But she kind of passes it on to her daughter-in-law with instruction knowing that she's beyond the age of really producing a son. And so now, uh, Ruth, being the younger, has that ability still. And so she instructs how she should carry on this thing in their culture. Scripturally, it wasn't as if it was manipulative, although they, they definitely took action within that cultural instruction to go and to seek this man, Boaz, as her husband, as her redeemer, her kinsman redeemer, um, who had already shown an affection for Ruth. And Ruth had already begun to show an affection for him. And so we'll pick up just as a review out of chapter 3 where she goes and she makes this connection with Boaz and actually proposes to him. I don't think we can see it any other way. But she's just asking from him what is his duty as that kinsman redeemer. So from chapter 3, and I know I told you to open to 4, just practice. Um, pick up in verse 8 with me. It says, now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And so she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. All, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a, a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if 
He will perform the duty of a close relative for you good. Let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Now we covered that pretty extensively last week, and if you weren't here for it, I'd encourage you to go back. I think the Lord showed us a lot in those verses. But these previous verses left us kind of at a point of dramatic tension. You know, who's it going to be? Is it going to be the nearer Redeemer that it seems Naomi either forgot or didn't know about, that Ruth certainly hadn't heard about up until now? It appeared that Ruth and Boaz were in love and wanted to get married. With Boaz exercising the right and responsibilities of the goel, we talked about that Hebrew term, the kinsman redeemer. Yet, as he said, there was one closer, and that person had a priority. And we've already learned that Boaz is a man of integrity. He's not going to step in where he shouldn't. He's going to make this right, and he's going to make it okay for that person that is nearer to either accept the responsibility or to refuse it. So the question is, as we come into this final chapter, Many of you probably know the story or read ahead. Um, But the question we have is, will the closer kinsman claim the right of kinsman redeemer towards Ruth and prevent her and Boaz from coming together? Told you. Chick flick the whole time. God's chick flick. So let's jump into chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friends, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So we learn in those verses that Boaz went up to the gate. And we need to remember that in those days, the gate was a place where the esteemed of the city, the, the, the elders of the city, the honored men s- sat. And they sat there because there the gate was kind of a combination of a city council chamber and a courtroom it's where they heard the business of the city and they made judgments between people that needed judgments made and it says here kind of humorously to me the near kinsman of who boaz had spoken came by so in the first scene of this chapter this near kinsman came by the city gates where boaz sat and and it's kind of surprising isn't it i mean this is a busy city i'm sure there's lots of people going to and fro. And I, and I think the words that are used there, and behold, and behold, there he is, the very man that would needed to come into this meeting, to needed to, to, to make this decision. So at the very outset, we see God's hand orchestrating what's taking place. I mean, what's the chances that he was going to spot this man in the crowds just passing by where he was bringing this case to be heard? So we won't call it a coincidence. But what it does point to, and I think we need to pay attention to, is God's invisible grace. Invisible in the fact that we don't see it. It's not that it can't be seen. But so often God's grace just moves in our lives, covers so many things that we can't cover, where we're too weak. And it's invisible to us because either one, we're not looking for it, or he didn't intend us to see it to begin with. But he's moving and he cares for us and he's doing things. Now remember, Ruth had quietly gone back home after being at the threshing floor at Boaz's instruction. So Boaz approaches this nearer kinsman and it's a complete surprise to this man. He hasn't even heard this case. He doesn't even know this is coming, which is good because there hasn't been a time really for gossip. So the meeting begins in verse 3. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So it says here that Naomi sold the piece of land. So the duty of the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, was more than the duty to preserve the family name of his brother in Israel. It was also to keep the land that was allotted to the members of the family within the family. You might recall when we went through the book of Joshua that all the land was divvied up. That was part of God's plan that the land would be divvied up and certain people would keep it. And God had an intention for them to keep it. 
all the way down to a relationship like this that was broken by death, that there would be a method to keep that land that was assigned within the families. So it was important to God, and it trickled down to be important to man, and now we see this case actually being played out. Remember, even the Jubilee, the Jubilee which would take place every seven years, and then the, 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 the bigger Jubilee on the 50th year, and on the 50th year, all the land was to be returned back to its owners. And so, again, it was just an illustration of this being important to God. Not only that the offspring of that family would continue by a male child, but that the land would also be in the family's possession. So as Boaz brings the matter up with the nearer kinsmen, he brings it up as a matter regarding property. Something really any man would be interested in. And why wouldn't this man want to buy back a piece of property and keep it in the family name? When Boaz put it in the terms of purely a land tra tra transaction, there was no hesitation on that kinsman redeemer's part. He says, I'll redeem it. Now, when we consider human nature, we might think there'd be some manipulation going on here. You might think that Boaz would put him in a corner and make this work for him, but it's, his clear intention here is to be honest, above board. He's not doing anything manipulative. He confesses, really, Boaz does it. He himself wants to redeem it. And he wants to make it entirely clear to this Redeemer that he will if he doesn't. It's interesting how much of man of integrity Boaz has been throughout this entire story, and he remains that to the very end. So the nearer Redeemer hears Boaz's proposal, states his willingness to redeem it, and at that moment, the near Redeemer agreement probably seemed very crushing to Boaz. Because it probably seemed like he'd lost everything. He was honest. He was honest about his intention with Ruth. He was honest about his intention with his nearer kinsman. And now the man says, I'll do it. And so for a moment, I think probably his heart fell. He's going to lose the lamb, which I don't think was his first priority. But he was going to lose Ruth, which I think was his priority. Now, strategically, I didn't say manipulatively. Strategically, Boaz offers up the rest of the story. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the land of Naomi, hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. So he told him he wasn't only dealing with Naomi and the property of Elimelech, that he also had to deal with Ruth. Naomi was older and beyond the years of bearing children, so the nearer kinsman was not expected to marry Naomi and raise up children to the family name of her deceased husband, Elimelech. But Ruth was another matter. She was able to marry and able to bear children. And this part was news to the nearer Redeemer. It probably was a lot to take in. It would be, I think, for any of us. Sure, I'll buy a piece of land. Oh, by the way, it comes with a wife. So it wasn't only about the property, it was about the posterity as well. And that was the surprising thing. Verse 6 and the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So it would have been great to receive the property for this man that was associated with Ruth. But the near kinsman knew that taking Ruth into his home and raising up her children would ruin his own inheritance. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but we could do a little, I think, accurate guessing. Possibly this man had grown sons. And maybe they had already received their inheritance of the lands that they owned. Now there'd be a problem dividing that land, redividing that land, then including the children of a new wife. That would ruin his inheritance and the inheritance of his children. Also, very likely in that culture, this man was married. And he knew it would be awkward, to say the least, to bring home Ruth as wife number two. But then we hear the response of the nearer redeemer. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it now. I'm pretty sure that that made Boaz pretty happy. And there's an indication that Naomi and Ruth were probably there in the crowd, listening to this all take place. We can't prove that. A lot of commentators believe that. So if that were the case, I think they would have been relieved and happy at that point as well. Now Boaz, a moment before, seemed to have lost everything that the nearer kinsman was going to take, but when he said he would redeem it, but then he changes his mind. 
Now, it's interesting to me, at least, that these passages never mention the name of the nearer Redeemer. And the most natural explanation would be possibly the writer of this book didn't want to embarrass the family later on because there's a pretty heavy penalty for actually denying this responsibility. But I think it's ironic as a literary effect that the reader, the man who wanted to preserve his name and be remembered, didn't end up in there in the, anyway. And so it's, it's just interesting to me that his name is removed from there when he could have been the one. But God had a plan. God had a plan. Verse 7 of our text. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the closer relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. You know, it never tells us if they give the sandal back. I just wonder if there's a lot of business that day. There's people walking around with one sandal. I don't know. But that was their exchange. That was their symbol of, of passing, of making a deal. You know, we might think of it as a receipt, bill of sale, a handshake even. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, describes the ceremony that's conducted here when the kinsman declined his responsibility. And it's a little bit harsher in the, in the way that it was described originally because the one declining removed a sandal and the woman he declined to honor spat in his face by God's instruction. Pretty interesting. But in this case, there was no real lack of honor considered, so they just did the part of the ceremony involving the sandal. Pick up at verse 9. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have brought all that bought all that was at Limelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's, which are the sons from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, <clears throat> I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from the position of, at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So Boaz joyfully proclaims, and also at the same time, he's legally sealing this transaction that he would redeem both the property and the posterity of Elimelech and take Ruth, the woman he loved, as his wife. Now, it's interesting, back in chapter 1, Ruth seemed to be giving up on her best chance of marriage by leaving her native land of Moab and giving her heart and life to the God of Israel. But as Ruth put God first, he brought her together in a relationship greater than anything she could have imagined. And really in that, we have this lovely picture of just, righteous, duty-driven redeemer motivated by love. That's the picture we have in Boaz. Boaz, a man of character who lived a life of integrity. Remember, privately he did so, like in his interactions with Ruth. Publicly he did so in his dealings with the nearer redeemer in full view of everyone. In fact, he was committed to his cause despite the cost, even to the point of exchanging his own name but really to carry on the name of another man. And that's a beautiful picture of the substitution that takes place by the kinsman redeemer. And it points us to the supreme redeemer who substituted himself on our behalf. And of course, we're speaking of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Jesus being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So the cost, what he was willing to pay to redeem us. And Boaz just being a picture of that love that he carried. From 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for this, your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And so he bought us back. He redeemed us. And this chapter is just a beautiful story of redemption. But we need to recognize that it points to the greater redemption, initiated and paid for by the great Redeemer. As we read, it was Jesus that did that. He was our great Redeemer. He did it on the cross. He paid the price to redeem us and to buy us back. And the thing is, if you're redeemed today, 
if you know for sure that you're redeemed, then Jesus has something to say to you. And it's sort of the way Boaz spoke to Ruth. And from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, beginning in verse 1, your Redeemer says this to you, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. He bought us back by his blood on the cross. He did it because he loved us. And then he comes in treating us like the bride that the church is. He treats us as our husband and he protects us. Now, picking up in verse 11 of our text, we listen to the response of those that witnessed this union between Boaz and Ruth. It says, all the people were at, who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamor bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this woman. So they, they celebrate and they bring this prayer forth, comparing what they want for them, what they want for Ruth, to famous biblical people of the past. And it says, like Rachel, like Leah. And remember that these two women had 13 children between them. They were the mothers of the whole nation of Israel. And so think about the sizable blessing that's being put upon these two. It's a blessing for both Boaz and Ruth to be even considered worthy of bringing such a great thing about. And then it says, may your house be like the house of Perez. Now, the family of Perez had settled in Bethlehem. Boaz was a descendant of Perez. And Tamar, the mother of Perez, who's mentioned here, we, if you go back and study her story, definitely was not a godly woman, but her name is found in the genealogy of Jesus. Just like other women that were, like Rahab, a harlot. And I love to point those things out because it means literally that God can and will use whomever he chooses. And that you are never so stained that he can't wash you up and make you something special for his plans and his purposes. Man, how good is that grace? Verse 13 says, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Now, the gift of children was never taken for granted in Israel. It should never be taken for granted anywhere. The fact that Boaz and Ruth were able to raise up a son to the deceased Elimelech was evidence of God's blessing. Verse 14, then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. And so here we see Naomi, who we've been with since the beginning of the story, and look how blessed she is in all of this. She now has a grandson. She's now famous in Israel. And she now becomes the nurse to her own grandson. Wow. And it made sense that these blessings in the life of Naomi are given so much attention at the end of this book. Because Naomi was the one whose return to the Lord began this great work of God. Think about it. If Naomi hadn't decided to go back to Bethlehem, back to the land of Israel, and the God of Israel, none of this would have happened. So, in review, don't get excited yet, the story of Ruth portrays God's blessing on the righteous. You should think about that. This outcome was only possible through Boaz's righteous response. Through his actions, Boaz communicates to us a picture of Christ. Boaz's person and character illustrate the incredible, we learned this word in chapter 1, chesed. His incredible compassion and loving kindness that Christ possessed for his people. Remember, that was something that Ruth 
excuse me, Naomi, had wished for her daughter-in-laws. Back in chapter 1, verse 8, she said, it said, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, which is the word chesed, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And that blessing goes on to Ruth and even comes full back to her, herself, Naomi. Now we also see in Boaz a picture of the great measures Jesus is willing to take to redeem his bride. Even though Ruth came from a family that had turned their backs on the Lord, the Lord turned his face towards Ruth and revealed himself through Boaz. Boaz foreshadowed Jesus the Messiah, the ultimate kinsman redeemer who will redeem a bride for himself, the church. You know, kind of as an aside, I thought this was interesting enough to, to mention this morning. It's interesting to notice the position of the book of Ruth in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. If you were to pick up the, what we would call the Bible that a Jewish person would have, it's what we call the Old Testament. Obviously, they don't, they don't follow the New Testament. And they don't call it the Bible either. They, some may, but most don't. They'll call it the Holy Scriptures. And in that Hebrew Scriptures, if we were to have one, and you looked into the table of contents or go through the Bible itself, you'll find those books are in a different order than we have them in our Bible. They were changed around when they were rewritten. Not, not the words of them, but the actual order of them. And one thing I find interesting, because Book of Ruth is, comes way later in the Old Testament than it does in ours, in, in theirs than it does in ours. But one of the interesting things is Ruth comes very shortly right before, or very shortly right after Proverbs which is totally out of the order that you have. Now, why am I bringing that up? I'll tell you why. Because the book of Proverbs, all the way through, illustrates the wisdom of a righteous man. And it concludes with chapter 31, which is the description of a virtuous woman. And it's not hard to see the righteous Boaz as wisdom personified. We have that represented there in the Proverbs. He's a wise man who acts with respect and dignity, even in the most tempting situation. Now it's interesting, Ruth, who was a Moabitess, she was personified as being virtuous. Remember what we just read at the beginning, verse 11 of chapter 3, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. So consider that that verse in the book of Ruth literally reads this all the gate of my people knows that you are a woman of worth and then in proverbs 31 speaking of the virtuous woman it says let her own works praise her in the gates so it's as if the scribes of the hebrew bible place the book of ruth after proverbs to point to the marriage between the wise man and the virtuous woman i thought that was Now as a redeemer, Boaz not only took Ruth as a wife, but he also fulfilled the law by producing a son to carry on a Limelech's family line. It says in verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Now if you don't know this story and you've never heard it taught before, I'm hoping this will bring a smile to your face. Because from... This special son would come the royal bloodline from which King David would descend. Verse 17 says, Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this name Obed, it says to the, to the, to the child of Naomi, grandchild is what it means. Obed, the name means serving or to serve or bonded to, which we get this picture of the bond servant that comes up so often in the New Testament. But listen, not only would the great King David descend through this child, but even more importantly through this child would descend the greatest king of all, King Jesus. These were the parents of that lineage. Not the first because it came down before them, but it comes down to them. And through this offspring, through all of this great um, movements of God's hand in their lives. 
comes the continuation of a bloodline that really began in Genesis and now is continued through this child Obed, through this beautiful relationship that God put together that would lead to King David himself and then to our Lord Jesus. And you see as that chapter closes, it has that genealogy, starts with Perez and it continues down through those five verses all the way to Obed who begot Jesse uh, and Jesse begot David. Now it's interesting because of David, God said this from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Listen, it says, when your days, speaking of David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now some of that pertains to his son Solomon. But it's a messianic statement speaking that through David the seed would come that would lead to the Messiah and his kingdom upon the, di- upon the throne of David would then continue forever. And so if you weren't impressed with the story of Ruth just as a story, and you weren't impressed with the story of Ruth just as a love story, and even if you weren't, and shame on you, impressed with God's sovereign hand in the lives of these people and the character of those that went through it, then be impressed, be excited that God would take people that would have seemed probably just so common to us if we lived with with them or nearby them in those days and he orchestrated he orchestrated the continuation of a bloodline that would lead to the savior of the world what's he doing in your life what's that bloodline doing in your life because if you're saved if you've been redeemed then that blood continues to flow through you and there's a will for you And there's a perfect, wonderful plan for your life. And God is doing things for you, in you, through you, around you, that we could not fathom. You know, our current president and other very wise people get credited with this this interesting um, uh, description, saying they're playing 4D chess. You ever heard that? Because it takes such a complicated mind to be able to manipulate things so deep into the process. And yet there's no process that God's not already beyond. And so he's not manipulating anything. What he's doing is drawing us to himself through the plans that he has for each of our lives. Those plans are perfect and they're good. Now this goes on to explain something else that's familiar to you. And you may have had questions about it before. Listen, Naomi's return to Bethlehem and the roots of David in Bethlehem, going back to Ruth and Boaz, are why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to register for the census of Augustus in the Christmas story. You wonder, why did they have to go all the way back there? This is the origin of that need, of that that whole bloodline that would bring them back. Ruth and Boaz are the very reason why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But consideration of Jesus in this book of Ruth doesn't begin with this mention of King David. Throughout the whole book, Jesus has been pictured by Boaz and the office of kinsman redeemer. Let's consider these points. The kinsman redeemer had to be a family member. Jesus added humanity and his eternal deity to his eternal deity, becoming part of the human family so he could be our kinsman kinsman redeemer and save us. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying family members out of slavery. Jesus redeemed, redeemed us from slavery, to, <clears throat> from slavery to sin and death. Sorry, The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying back land that had been forfeited. Jesus will redeem the earth that mankind forfeited to Satan. Boaz, as kin, kinsman redeemer to Ruth, was not motivated by self-interest, but motivated by love for Ruth. Jesus' motivation for redeeming us is his great love for us. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, had to have a plan to redeem Ruth unto himself, and some might have thought the plan to be foolish. Jesus had a plan to redeem us, 
And some probably thought that was foolish, saving men by dying for them on a cruel cross. Yet the plan works, and it's glorious. Boaz, as kinman redeemer to Ruth, took her as his bride. The people Jesus has redeemed are collectively called the church, called his bride. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, provided a glorious destiny for Ruth. Jesus, as our redeemer, provides a glorious destiny for us. So to close, listen to these words regarding our kinsman redeemer from the Hebrew scriptures, particularly from the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 4. He says there, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were, were refused, says our God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. Are you happy this morning that you have a Redeemer? Are you happy that He was so in love with us that He took on the form of a man, lived a life that He didn't really deserve, died a death that was totally unfair, unjustified, illegal, and He did it all to redeem us, to make us His bride. And he did it through an integrity and a way about himself that really all we can do is try to practice and give the Lord all the room he needs to make us like him. So it was a small story, but it's a great story. And it was definitely a love story. And above all, and I'll repeat it again, it was a story that we need to recognize, if for no other reason, to come to faith in the fact that God is working all the time in each of our lives to bring all kinds of good things about. And the time to remember that is the time where we're asking, why this? Why now? Why the warfare? Why the troubles? Why the tribulations? Why can't things be a little bit easier? Imagine how hard they'd be without God. So we rest there. Now we're probably going to be in James for a while on Wednesday nights, so we're just going to push right into 1 Samuel next week, following with Ruth. Another great book, another great study. But this morning, as we come to the communion table, I don't think you needed any other type of story to remind you of how thankful to be. So spend this time, church, spend this time, bride of Christ, with your husband, thanking him that he lived the life that he did, a life that he didn't have to live, to die a death he had to die in order to redeem us. And I think I'll just keep it that simple. Worship, ushers. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for this instruction of yours we thank you that you left us this word i thank you lord for the picture or the mighty picture that you've given us of what it meant for your righteousness to cover us and for your love to pursue us and woo us into your presence into your life that lord you went to an extent that none of us can even begin to understand but we can be thankful this morning that you did. And we're thankful, Lord, that you call us your bride. And we thank you, Lord, like a good husband. You've promised to come for us. And you're coming for us at a day that only you know. And Lord, we await that with great anticipation. So Lord, as we come to the communion table this morning, let us just be thankful. Thankful for what you laid down. 
in order to pick us up. And we just give you all glory and honor this morning. In Jesus' name.